As the flagship of Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, Seregios drives much of the mid-game story when a displaced flock of them begins to show up all over the old world, panicked from their usual roost by a large individual driven mad by a hostile virus. Between its unique morphology, its clashes with other flying wyverns, and the mystery of its natural habitat, there's a lot to explore with Seregios, so let's dive right in. Now if I may be so bold as to steal from Roanoke himself, we're going to start with the feet. Anyone up to date on their ornithology will know that Seregios has zygodactyl feet, which is to say two toes in the front and two in the back. This is seen perhaps most prevalently in parrots, in our close proximity to them as pets, but also in other birds like woodpeckers, cuckoos and ospreys, so very often in birds that need to grip strongly, be it onto fish or branches, but most significantly for us, it is also seen in owls. So how exactly does an owl foot compare with other birds of prey? They have short, strong toes and very large but only weakly curved talons. These and other adaptations allow for a very strong grip strength and constriction for things held within the foot. Most owls eat primarily rodents and other small prey, and the foot is adapted to this by preventing escape and the long talons increasing the reach of what can be held in the foot. So from this it seems to suggest Seregios isn't regularly killing large prey. As a good-sized wyvern, of all the owls it's probably most accurate to compare Seregios to an eagle owl, or a great horned owl. Whilst there's no specific studies of their feet compared to other owls to see if they have adaptations for different prey, they still also exhibit zygodactyl feet. Whilst eagle owls are often famed for their power in occasionally taking foxes or small ungulates, this is quite rare, and their preferred prey is often rabbits. Seregios possibly also has a similar size ratio with its prey. The next step in exploring Seregios' ecology is to try and guess where they live. Seregios are said to inhabit an extremely limited area, but we never get told what exactly this area is. Whilst the displaced Seregios appear in just about every map in 4U, they seem to be most common in the dunes, where their quests take place, and this may be where some of them have settled for their reappearance there in generations too. So let's go out on a limb and assume Seregios live in deserts or other arid areas too. When we look at a rough map of Monster Hunter's old world, the southern subcontinent that contains the desert maps is a pretty large one, and it's likely a mix of desert and arid savanna, maybe with some coastal forests. This area isn't hugely populated, other than coastal ports like Valhabar, it's only really the hunting hub town of Loch Lac that's the primary settlement here. If we suggest that the maps hunts take place in are similar to the land deals used by hunters and safari operators, called traverses or concessions, and that hunters, gatherers and guild members operate in these areas only, and leave the rest of it untouched, except for mapping and exceptional circumstances, then the bulk of this region may be mainly unexplored too. Seregios could be more common across this huge and poorly known area than first thought. After suggesting that Seregios eats smaller prey and lives in arid areas, then the most obvious candidates for regular prey items are Cephalos, Genprey, and Delex. This is quite notable as the former two both possess neurotoxic venom, in the Genprey's fangs and the Cephalos's fins respectively. From various Seregios attacks, we can see that it's actually quite a dexterous wyvern for something so big. It's able to strike quickly with great precision and force. This is much like another animal that hunts with its feet and often takes venomous prey, the secretary bird. The secretary bird kills its prey with fast, powerful kicks, and snakes are its most famous prey, but really they'll take anything they can fit into their mouth. The strikes delivered by the kicks of the secretary bird deliver five times its body weight. This is a pretty impressive hit, and from a Seregios this would also be a hell of a strike. They also deliver these blows at tremendous speed as well. Coupled with its feet so uniquely adapted to grab, this could be why Seregios moves as a quadruped as well. The larger you get, the more your limbs need to sacrifice flexibility and dexterity for load-bearing support. And like most other flying wyverns that remain volant, Seregios may spread its weight equally over its four limbs so it can retain the speed and flexibility in its hind legs and feet. Indeed, one of its carved descriptions says just that. While Seregios is still very mobile on four limbs, it can't charge like, say, a Rathian or a Tigrex, so it seems to have made the evolutionary trade-off for overall movement speed in return for strike speed, agility, and precision in its hind limbs specifically. Seregios likely uses such secretary bird-like kicks to either kill or incapacitate venomous, difficult prey items, 
Whilst the effects of their venom wouldn't be fatal to a Seregios, if neurotoxic venom reduces feeling or mobility in the feet, that could have long-term consequences. Genprey can likely be killed with a kick or two, but Cephalos may be immobilised or knocked down with a kick before being constricted in the zygodactyl feet and killed by Seregios snapping its neck, much like the way a barn owl prefers to kill its prey. In 4U, Seregios is notable for his interactions with Rathalos and Rathian too. In one cutscene, a Seregios attacks and drives off a Rathian. In another, one fights with an Azure Rathalos. This rivalry is also visited in other media, with the same two events happening in the 4th gen size comparison video. And as well in Gaijin Hunter's cover of the 15th anniversary event in Tokyo, there was an artwork of a Seregios harassing a Rathian too. So what may this competitive relationship be? If we examine the initial assault, it doesn't look like attempted predation. The Seregios makes no attempt to follow the Rathian after she leaves, and even a wounded Rathian is likely going to be a pretty dangerous target for even a Seregios. The bulk of Seregios prey likely being smaller animals also means that there will be lessened competition between the two as well, so it may not just be good old fashioned rivalry between predators. The fact Seregios leaves shortly after as well makes me believe the Seregios attacked in the belief Rathian had a nest for it to raid only to leave when it found out she had no chicks. Whilst Rathalos is just generally belligerent, it also makes sense for him to be so aggressive on sight to Seregios. Where their ranges overlap, it would make sense for Rathalos to attack Seregios on sight to drive them out of the area when they may threaten Rathalos chicks. Eagle owls in our own world are notorious killers of other birds of prey, and a lot of these are often on young animals still in or around the nest. While some of these and most adult attacks are nocturnal blitzkrieg attacks when their opponent's vision is limited in the darkness, raptors probably make up more of eagle owl diet than any other bird of prey, averaging between 3 and 5%, but almost 10% in some places. This may not sound like a lot, but when you think about how much other prey there is and how low in number other predators are, it's pretty significant. To be clear, I don't think Seregios specifically select for Rathian versus other wyverns, but I do think that Rathian nests may be uniquely vulnerable, and possibly the most common large desert wyvern. As we established in their video, subordinate Rathian nest in the less productive areas that are unoccupied, primarily deserts. These open environments have few good nest sites, and with no Rathalos to help protect the nest or bring the female food, the chicks will be incredibly vulnerable. Their species function at its best as mated pairs in woodland or grassland or wetland mosaics. But in just about every species with a social hierarchy, there are inevitably losers that have a significantly poorer quality of life and very little chance of improving things. That is just our poor Desert Rathian's lot. While Seregios probably doesn't need nocturnal ambushes like an eagle owl's when it can just wait for the Rathian to go and find food, if it's hungry, it may still come to harass the Rathian to create a chaotic situation where snatching a chick or two can occur. The swift and precise kicks can also be very useful here, as they allow a Seregios to engage with the Rathian without getting envenomated by her quills. Seregios may even be in an evolutionary arms race with Rathian and Rathalos, with the two constantly evolving new attacks and defences against each other. It may even be possible Seregios is a factor in the two rearing chicks as a pair as well, as we don't actually know if all other wyverns do this too. But what about everyone else? And does Seregios have adaptations as an S raider too? Quite possibly. Seregios's trade-off of speed for mobility likely means that it's probably the best climber among the flying wyverns. The powerful grip and reach of its zygodactyl feet not only allow it to reach into nests and pull chicks out, but also to anchor it to rock surfaces and cliffs where nests are likely to be. The African Harrier Hawk, or Gymnogene, has an adapted joint in the tibiotarsus and tarsometatarsus to allow it to raid both nests and clamber through trees, and even walk upside down from branches and nests. Seregios probably doesn't need anything quite this flashy, as even the smallest wyverns and their relatives like winged drakes still probably have to either nest on the ground or nest on cliffs and other rock surfaces. For this, both his gripping feet and the hooked claws on its wings allow it to scale steep slopes and tricky surfaces as it hunts. Seragios probably doesn't just eat Rathian chicks either. As said, it may raid Remobra and Wingdrake nests in the old world, especially if they're social breeders. As ornithologist Peter Stain said about the African Harry Hawk, it likes its prey to be both conspicuous and colonial, and indeed almost a quarter of its diet is weaver birds. Barrioth dig dens for the cubs, chicks, babies, to rest in while the mother hunts, and presumably sand Barrioth do something similar. Again, the mobile snatching limbs of Seregios could be used to drag the offspring out to their doom. Karopako is definitely at risk as well. As for this small wyvern, both adults and chicks could be very viable prey. 
Apsaros also seem to nest in caves as per the godforsaken egg-carrying missions in the first game, and this may be an attempted defence against Seregios. Any Apsaros mother who doesn't choose a deep enough cave may well wind up with burgled young. Seregios' diet likely varies seasonally, with Genprey and Cephalos and other desert dwellers forming the bulk of the prey, with large seasonal influxes of the chicks of other various wyverns and wing drakes when they're hatched in the breeding season. But what about Seregios' relationship with its own kin? What could that be like? The Master of Defense says Seregios are savagely territorial and fight each other for space, but then he also says he's never seen one and they're really rare and unknown, so he may not be an authority. A large number of Seregios are displaced by the frenzied individual, which suggests that there may be some social aspect to them. It's unlikely that Apex Seregios flew all over the place bullying each individual member of the flock into leaving. I think it's unlikely Seregios are permanent pack animals, solely due to the ecosystem being unable to support so many. But come the breeding season, they may nest communally, or at least within close proximity to one another, similar to vultures in what is known as a loose colony. In vultures, this is to help with foraging, but in Seregios, I'd imagine it's more for joint defence, as after all their size would force them to nest on the ground, where they may be vulnerable to myriad desert predators. Some that single or even pairs of Seregios may struggle to repel. Birds of prey and owls will also ground nest in open areas, preferring dense cover but also doing surprisingly well in very broken terrain where they can hide nests or shelter them with their bodies too. If it all sounds a bit rich that Seregios may live in the same noisy colonies they love to predate, then this may well come at a cost, but from within. Herring gulls, whilst famed for stealing chips and ice creams nowadays, are surprisingly predatory. As well as their more natural diet of fish, they will readily eat the chicks of other seabirds and live in large colonies. One study found that one or two mated pairs in these colonies actually feed their own young and themselves almost entirely on the chicks of their fellow colony mates. This is not an indication of a food shortage or aggressive behaviour, it's just a small few opportunistic individuals taking advantage of an untapped resource. In another similar type of gull, the lesser black-backed, this behaviour can take on a more destructive form. Male gulls in particular who lose their offspring can become aggressive failed breeders, and begin to eat the chicks from other nests. This results in a domino effect that can doom a colony or reduce it to very low breeding success indefinitely. The effect on the colony in 4 Ultimate may have been quite severe. If the Apex Seregios attacked its own colony in the nesting period, then that entire breeding year likely failed for the whole colony. If not, it still may have had significant effects and fractured the colony into a downward spiral. It's kind of frustrating for the Monster Hunter game with the best story that we never really get a resolution as to what happens to the displaced Seregios flock, as really they're quite pitiable in the grand scheme of things. It's a lot like the episode of Gendi Tartakovsky's Primal, The Plague of Madness, where the diseased sauropod violently kills its own family. Whilst presumably most of the Seregios managed to escape, they were still attacked from within by their own kind, and then chased out of their home into unfamiliar territories where they were just then set upon by the guild. Finally, let's talk a little bit more about morphology. Most notably, Seregios has a large nasal horn, the use of which is unclear. It's tempting to say it could aid flight, but really this seems unlikely considering its broad, flat surface would also just catch any crosswinds. This could also be an example of the handicap hypothesis, in that it's an adaptation that deliberately makes life harder to show off individual fitness. If this was the case, we'd likely expect to see them more prevalent in males. We never really get told if Seregios have sexual dimorphism, or what the sexes are of the few that we fight in game. So it's interesting to imagine that females may have smaller, less distinctive horns, or even none at all. If both sexes have horns, the males could become embellished in the breeding season, much like how some puffins' beaks become larger and fancier in certain times of the year. The horn could become adorned with various keratinous ornaments or bright colours too. Another possible use related to breeding is just good old-fashioned fighting as well. Helmeted and great hornbill males will fly at each other and crash into one another in mid-air. It's been suggested that this is some behaviour that occurs prior to the breeding season, perhaps to establish dominance. Perhaps Seregios may also use their horns for these aerial jousts to attract and secure mates. The helmeted hornbill in particular has reinforced struts in its cask to take these impacts. The material these casks are made of are often called hornbill ivory, and maybe a Seregios horn looks similar on the inside. Seregios's unique scales I always just took as being a simple mix of anti-predator defence, and possibly to contribute into harassing wyverns off their nests. The acquisition of wyvern chicks would no doubt be a cause of occasional violence. 
and so Seregios may prevent effective counterattacks by developing very loose scales that shatter easily and embed themselves in an opponent. These shards would quite obviously create pain, irritation, and likely infection too, much like the quills of a porcupine. It's quite hard to bite and grapple with Seregios without covering yourself in painful cuts. Few animals can actually launch projectiles in the same way, but tarantulas have been seen to fire quills that irritate the sensitive areas of attackers. Seregios is still potentially at threat from various larger monsters like elder dragons or basil juice, so whilst rare it may still need a quick defence in the form of scale launching. The fact Seregios also rattles them in hostile situations is also a suggestion that these scales are used in self-defence as well, as such signals are often typically warnings to other species in nature. Porcupines with their quills and rattlesnakes use their own noises to try and repel attackers first to try and prevent things from escalating into costly violence. For my thoughts on Seregios, he's probably the monster I've done the biggest 180 on. When I first saw him, I'd effectively logged out of the franchise for a while, only dipping back in occasionally, and I just sort of rolled my eyes. Seeing that they'd wasted the pangolin scale idea on another generic flying wyvern was just so disappointing. But then when I looked more into it, and played it, and fought Seregios, my opinion quickly began to change with how unique a fight he was, and how almost all of his moves are tailor-made for him. Plus how much I've just come to like his design in general with his quadrupedal nature, but not in the same way as a Tigrex, and his zygodactyl feet as well. His music is also some of my favourite, especially the really rapid parts that match well with his kicks in the middle of the fight. And now if I were ever to make a monster tier list, he's in my S rank. Apparently that makes me unique as well. Rage Gaming's apparently doing a poll that found Seregios was the least favourite flagship, even behind Azure Rathalos. Whilst I'm confident as a flagship he'll be back, but I don't think it'll be in Rise. Maybe Rise Ultimate, but I'm still unsure. I feel with his history of interaction with other monsters and his overall character, he'd be best suited to a world-like game. Hopefully 6th gen will see his return. With his recent entry to the franchise, he doesn't really need too big an update as well, but it'd still be nice to see him with some new moves. Hopefully he won't get some obnoxious and nonsensical subspecies either, as Seregios has done pretty well to avoid that so far. I'd love if he could pick up and throw smaller monsters at you as well, and upgrade his pin attack to straight away grabbing other hunters to throw at you, maybe even two at once. Plus, he's also ripe for a good few turf wars. Thanks for watching. What with the lifting of restrictions here in the UK, I now have to do that whole getting a job nonsense, so I can earn money to pay for things. So these videos might come out a bit later or with longer gaps in between, but rest assured I'll still be making them for now at least. If you joined me for Seragios and made it this far, then hopefully you'll like, subscribe and share with your friends as well. There's also apparently that notification bell dealio as well that's meant to help. I'm not sure if everyone hated my Lord of the Rings video, or if you just didn't see it or were indifferent to it, or even if you're purely here for Monster Hunter, but still. I'm seeing a lot of people seem to think the COVID-19 situation is effectively over, so maybe I picked the worst time to actually start this whole YouTube channel thing as well. But I'm always appreciative of any likes, comments, or subscriptions anyway. And the more who watch, the more theories and ideas come in as well. Next time we'll be doing two monsters who aren't actually related and only one of them roars, so here's the teaser for half of the next episode.